Hello everyone and welcome to this Spotlight webinar, My Route to Charter Status with the IFM, developed and delivered by the Institute of Fisheries Management and the Society for the Environment, SOCEMB. My name is Sarah Ridgen, I'm the Policy and Communications Officer at SOCEMB and I'll be hosting today's webinar. So moving on to the content of today's webinar, firstly a little bit of an introduction to SOCEMB. For those of you who don't know, we are an umbrella body responsible for licensing the awarding of environmental professional registrations. There are over 7,500 registered environmental professionals globally, and 15% of these are based outside the UK, which is a growing proportion of the registered environmental professional community. So IFM are one of 24 professional bodies, as shown on the slide, with a license to award the Charter Environmentalist or CM registration to their members. I'm now going to provide a brief overview of the CM registration. So what does being a CM mean? Firstly, it means being judged by your peers to be working at the highest possible standard when it comes to your skills, knowledge and experience, the gold standard. Secondly, holding CM status means that an individual has signed the Society's Code of Professional Conduct, which commits an individual to upholding fair and professional standards at all times. Being a CM also means a commitment to carrying out continuous professional development, or CPD. Thirdly, due to the highest standards the CM has demonstrated to meet, they are showing leadership within the environmental profession. So the outcome of demonstrating professionalism and the highest of standards carries with it many benefits, even via using the simple, uh, the simple use of the post-nominal CM. Uh, Charter environmentalists cite increased confidence, professional credibility and career opportunity as a result of their CM registration. Our profiles and podcast interviews of and with current CMs demonstrate the beneficial impacts the registration has had on their careers. And the URLs for these resources are showing on the screen now. So please go ahead and check them out for inspiration. So helping to build increased confidence, professional credibility and career opportunity beyond the registration in and of itself are the opportunities and resources that come with being a CM. So these include speaker opportunities with SOCM, for example, via our webinars, discounted access to events, including events to highlight the cross-sector nature of the CM community, and that includes networking opportunities as well, and opportunities to showcase good practice through the SOCM website and e-newsletter and achievements via our annual SOCM awards. And I just wanted to highlight now the hashtag IMCM campaign, which we ran last year, um, which saw charter environmentalists from across sectors come together online to share their vital work, career journeys, challenges and opportunities. And it was a phenomenal success, uh, reaching an estimated quarter of a million people. Uh, the campaign demonstrated both the power of the CM community and the opportunity to connect across the community, um, across the various sectors that I've already mentioned. And it also, the campaign also showed the rising profile of CM as a professional registration as well. So in our bid to move CM to an industry standard profile of registration, we are seeing that CM is increasingly valued by professionals and employers. 81% of CMs said they were likely or very likely to recommend CM to others in our survey earlier this year. And employers are also recognizing the value of CM. We have 14 CM employer champions, and these are organizations that have embedded CM registration into their organizations in order to support the professional development of their staff. So that's a little bit of a brief overview um, into, of CM. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Pete Turner, CM, who is the fisheries officer at the Environment Agency. As a charter environmentalist registered via the IFM, Pete is going to explore his rather unusual route to gaining CM status last year and how doing so has helped his professional development. So over to you, Pete. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Pete Turner. Um, I currently work for the Environment Agency as a fisheries officer covering the river air catchment up in what is a pretty grey Yorkshire this morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about three bits. Um, I'm going to give you a potted history of my 35 year to date career working with with fish and in fisheries. Um, talk about why at this uh, 
time I decided to go for uh, chartered status and um, lastly what it's what it's meant and how it's changed things for me so I suppose like like a lot of people um, when I was young um, I decided I wanted to work in fisheries I was an angler I was always out and about getting wet and mucky and it seemed like a great idea unfortunately um, I decided that school wasn't for me um, so when I was about 15 years old, I, I went to a local commercial fishery. And when I say commercial fishery, I don't mean commercial fisheries like we have today. This was a, a large estate complex with, with three lakes and a tackle shop. And I did the usual stuff, selling day tickets, checking day tickets, working in the shop, riddling maggots and cleaning them up. You know, all the, all the joyous things that the fishery owner didn't want to do. Um, and I stayed there for, for quite a long time. And it was there that I, I really got involved with the Institute of Fisheries Management as well, attending their um, regular meetings on an evening. And I've got to be honest, at that stage, a lot of what was discussed didn't mean an awful lot to me. But I persevered with it because it, it just felt like the right thing to do. So, as I say, I, I, I left school um, a couple of months before my A-levels. Um, Looking back, probably not the smartest thing I've ever done, but felt like the right thing to do at the time. And I kind of mooched around a little bit. Um, again, just staying involved with, with fisheries and keeping my hand in, but, but not actively working in it. And then in 1995, um, I, I got a bit of a break and I, I got a job with the then National Rivers Authority working in their regional communications centre. So I'm sure you're all aware of the the um environment agencies 0800 reporting number well if you rang it back in the day it was could have been me that you were speaking to so that really gave me a good grounding um in, in what the organization did and I, I used that to then move through a couple of other posts um within the organization uh mainly around water resources um some of that was spent as a, an enforcement officer in west yorkshire which gave me really good understanding of what was going on and it allowed me to link lots of lots of differing aspects together uh, and then in 2004 i was i was finally offered a chance to go and work in the fisheries department and and they've not got rid of me since so i my role is the usual stuff it's all the um the fishery management advice stuff it's a bit of survey and it's a lot of project work and and i'll be honest with you becoming chartered had never really entered my head until um, about eight years ago I started working for the Institute of Fishery Management um, managing their certificate course um, very popular course uh, lots of students worldwide um, who need quite a lot of hand holding um, and it was through the the regular training team meetings that that um, chartership started coming up as an option, but without a formal educational background, I, I honestly thought that I, I wouldn't stand a chance of, of going anywhere with it. I just didn't think it would stack up. I thought it would be an instant barrier. Um, however, um, I, I found out very quickly that that wasn't the case. And, and, and really it was something that, that was in, in my gift if I wanted to pursue it. So in uh, 2019, we, went away i went away with my family um to a little cottage in northumberland took my laptop with me and and over many bottles of wine uh, started making making a start on the um on the documents which emma will talk about in a little while and really wasn't as onerous as i thought it was going to be don't get me wrong it's not a two or three hour process but it's not it's not necessarily out of out of reach um, because what I realised is that really the paperwork for me as someone who has lots of experience but not a lot of um, accreditation through, through formal learning is the process for me is exactly the same as someone who's done um, a degree and has that formal route in. So it's all about just referencing what you've learned and what I realised very quickly is what I've learned doing my job on a day-to-day -day basis is a lot of the skills that, that come out throughout the, the ask for becoming a, a chartered member. The, the other thing is that for me and, and use them is, is through the IFM, I had a good support around me who were able to, to, to help me out with the paperwork. I, I was able to speak to people who'd already gone through the process and get hints and tips from them. 
Um, and I also had two fantastic sponsors who, who really helped me with, with my paperwork and identifying the, 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 the missing bits of information that maybe needed beefing up a little bit. Um, so, so I, I finally submitted with, you know, quite nervous about it, I suppose, um, in sort of January and, and I had my, um, had my interview in March, which, which thankfully I, I went through. Um, so it's, I, I was asked what it meant to me, um, and, and what it means in my day to day. And I, I struggled a little bit to answer that one, but then actually I, what I realized is I, I work with a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of consultants um, with lots of letters after their names. And, and I often felt quite intimidated or um, by some of it, be, just, just because in the back of my head, my, I realize I have an imposter who tells me that actually, because I don't have a, a formal background, that I really shouldn't be doing the job that I'm doing. And, and what Becoming Chartered has done is it's, it's, it's given me that confidence now it's given me something that says, yes, I am worthy to do this job. And I know as much as you do in some cases, and I can speak with authority and not feel that I'm out of my depth. So, so for me, it's, it really has given me um, a confidence. And to be honest, I wish I'd done it years ago. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's my background and that's what it means to me. Thank you, Pete. Um, it was really great to hear your, your kind of journey so far and how gaining CM has, has helped you. So thank you very much for that. Um, and we'll um, come back to questions after Emma's talk. Um, just a reminder that if you can ask any questions that you have via your toolbar. Um, and I'll be picking the questions up, like I say, after uh, Emma's talk. So without further ado, can I please welcome Emma Keenan, who is the Environmental Monitoring Officer at Natural Resources Wales. And uh, now that you've hopefully gained some insights into CM and the various benefits attached to registration, um, Emma's going to provide a bit of an overview of how to apply to become a CM via the IFM. So um, over to you, Emma. Thank you. Hi. So um I'm currently working for Natural Resources Wales. I'm no longer an environmental monitoring officer. I've, I'm now a specialist advisor for freshwater ecology and fisheries monitoring. Um, I've been this chartered environmentalist coordinator for about five, six years now. Um, and we've been working with the process to improve it in the IFM. So first and foremost, you need to be a full member of the IFM and have four to five years experience and once you have that you can start thinking about being chartered and as Pete said you don't need all the formal qualifications that a lot of your colleagues might have and that's what's so good about being being able to achieve chartered status is that you can demonstrate that you are good at your job without having to have those formal qualifications and they are not a barrier to achieving this so You've got full membership. What else do you need? So first and foremost, you're going to need your CV. This should just be a short and concise, maybe two sides long and up to date. We've had quite a few applications come through where they've not filled in the last two years on their CV. And obviously that gets sent back to them and they have to redo it. Now, after that, you've got your report. So this is where you need to demonstrate that you can do or that you can demonstrate your ability to cover all these competencies. So this is where you get to write and write and write and write. And some of our reports that we've had in are 13, 15 pages long. So it really is your opportunity to, to shine. Um, and the advice we give to people when they start this process is don't try and write a massive plan break it down. So start thinking about some projects you've worked on or you work on or some big aspects of your job. Write that out and then look at the competencies and then start matching the competencies to that particular project or role. And then see what, what competence your, competencies you're missing. So you might want to start with, say, three, three areas of work that you do or three projects that you've worked on and start matching up the competencies to that rather than going through each one of the competencies themselves and trying to find evidence for that just one competency because they will overlap so like p if you don't have a master's you'll need to do a master's equivalent report 
So this is just to demonstrate that you have that critical thinking um, that's required to be in a chartered environmentalist. Um, it's not a massive piece of work. It's one to two thousand words and it's got to be different to your full report. So what we're looking for is maybe a piece of research you've done or say if you work for the Environment Agency, if you've worked on a project, say fisheries officers have worked on many fish pass product, uh, projects or maybe you've done a pollution investigation or any works. Um, this could also be like an environmental impact assessment or if you work with R&D, if you do any R&D in your work, um, big technical reports, any of that sort of stuff. What we're looking for is an aim of the project, what that project was, details of what it was, the methodologies that you used during that project, outcomes and results, and in the end is the most important part. So you need to evaluate that product, uh, project, what you took away from it yourself, what you needed to improve, and what you think went well. And that's what will demonstrate your master's level of learning. So once you've got all that together, You've sent it off to Ian Turner if you're applying to the Institute of Fisheries Management. You have sent in your cheque or paid online. Um, that's when we'll receive it. That application is then sent to two assessors who will go through your application and make sure that you're right at the right standard to go through to the peer reviewed interview. If you're deemed good enough to go to PRI, we'll then move to the next phase. If not, you'll get feedback and advice on your application on how to improve it because we will not let you go through to your PRI if we think you won't pass. If there's any chance that we think you won't pass, we'll work with you until you get to the level that you can progress. So you will get to PRI and we will help you get there. When it comes to your PRI, at the moment we're holding all of ours via Zoom. We will start doing more in-person ones soon but I can't see that happening before Christmas. So everything else will be on Zoom. As part of that assessment, you'll be asked to produce a small talk, maybe 10 to 15 minutes long with a PowerPoint about projects that you work on to demonstrate your work in the environment and what sustainability means to you. Um, it'll then be the assessor's turn to ask questions about that presentation and they'll be trying to pick up any holes in your report or maybe if they feel like that some areas are a bit weak, they'll be trying to tease out some more information from you. But it's not cause for panic. It's a smooth process. And we will not have let you get there without thinking that you would pass. Once you've had your PRI, we then look at the um, assessor's comments. It comes back to us. Um, they will recommend whether you passed or failed. Um, in the entire time that I've been doing it, no one has failed. Um, we will then get together and we'll decide that we will award this person chartership. We will contact the Society for the Environment and then we'll contact you to let you know. And that's about it. Brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Um, so so now I think we'll just go straight on to questions now like just, like I said before just a reminder that you can um, continue to ask questions via the Q&A uh, function on your toolbar and we'll get to those in a minute and um, if I can just go to some questions though for now that were submitted in advance now some of the questions submitted already have been answered um, in Pete or Emma's talk so I'll just go to a few of the others so um, if I can come to you first um, uh, Pete, if you've got sort of one top tip that you would like to sort of highlight uh, for anyone who's who's looking to become a CM, is there is there sort of one main piece of advice that you think is really important to mention? Yeah, try and find somebody who's been through the process already and get get a view from them. Um, what I found really helpful was was um, getting some advice around how to lay out my master's equivalent report and my um, other documentation just to make sure that I wasn't flying off on a tangent. So just knowing something that's gone through the process previously rather than trying to reinvent it myself. No, that, that makes sense. It sounds like a great bit of advice there. I think just the, the kind of knowledge from, from someone who's been there, done that is always, um, always really helpful. Um, Emma, if I can come to you next. So um, 
how how long on average do you think the assessment process usually takes do you have like a rough rough sort of estimate from putting your application in yes yeah it can take a couple of months it depends how much work the application will need in addition to that and availability of assessors we're a very small organization so we don't have a vast number um and availability getting people together is still quite hard even through a zoom yeah about a couple of months from start to finish okay brilliant yeah everyone's very busy aren't they so it's always always a challenge but um no that sounds um sounds good um if I just come back to Pete now, so I've got a question here. Um, when did you sort of first become interested in the environment and sustainability, would you say? I get a lot of this through my day job. So, so as I said earlier on, I, environmentally, when I was very young, um, but actually working more into the sustainability bit of it has, has come more through my career working in fisheries for the last 15, nearly 20 years actually now. Um, so, so it's just a day-to-day thing. Okay, brilliant. So, so would you say that you, as a, as a child, you had that interest in the environment and that's sort of grown throughout time as well? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's taking it on and learning it, and that's something I've done through the IFM. Um, keep, keeping in touch with them has, has just helped to broaden my understanding and my learning. And obviously now through CPD, um, yes. I'm having to do that as part of the chatship process. Of course, yes. That sounds great. Um, I had some questions just submitted now, so I'll just come to those Come to those now. So I've got a question for both of you, both Pete and Emma. So it says, uh, can you describe the level and type of CPD each year? Um, so should we go to that part? And there's a second part of the question, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so Pete, do you want to go first on that one? Uh, I'm just, I'm not 100% certain what I'm supposed to be doing with my CPD because I said I've, I only became chartered in March last year, so I've not actually had a review yet. But basically what I'm doing is just recording everything that I do, um, any webinars I attend, any reading that I do. As I said earlier on, I do, um, I manage the certificate course for the IFM. So I'm able to gain a lot of CPD points through that process um, Emma's probably better placed to have a, a, a more broader what that looks like and how many points are needed and that sort of thing. Sure, thank you. So Emma, do you want to pick up on that? It's a shame our CPD officer isn't here. <laughs> yeah, the more varied the better. You can't just have a whole year of doing the same thing. You can't spend the year reading papers and books and gone, yep, CPD done. It needs to be varied. So for me, it's... Um, training temps it's giving talks it's attending conferences it's attending webinars it's um, teaching on the certificate course that Pete runs um, developing my own stuff Um, off the top of my head I can't remember what points we give to certain conferences and stuff but coming once we start putting those up again we'll start putting the amount of points are you get for attending certain talks and webinars and conferences as well so when you join onto them you'll know how many points you can put down next to it and there is guidance online brilliant thank you um if i just come to another question so there's a question here about um pete you mentioned the m- sort of um sponsorship in your if, the sort of sponsored role in your application that sort of thing um but there's a question here about uh, a mentoring or buddy scheme is is there sort of is that was that in place for you and did you benefit from that? Yeah, as I said earlier on, I, I uh, managed to find someone within the IFM training team who'd already got chartered status who who helped me a lot a long way with how to do my report, what that report needed to be, and then when I submitted that to one of my sponsors, they came back and said, what's really useful is if you look at the categories that you've got to, you've been assessed against, if you could, within the document, reference, when when you make a statement within your document, reference which of the capabilities you're addressing with that statement. So it just helped to to pull it all together um, and, and, and get it all in one place. So it's easy as well for the assessors to understand what you're trying to say and what you're trying to get across. So there's no misunderstandings. And then if there is any gray areas that gets picked up at the interview anyway. 
Yes, absolutely. I think it's that, that clarity, isn't it, of what the assessor is looking for. And on that note, we do have a webinar, um, a recording of a webinar um, on, on our YouTube channel, um, which is YouTube dot com forward slash society for the environment and that is this is just a webinar recording just on um basically assessor advice so two assessors talking about the advice that they have so i'll put the link to that in the chat as well if in case anyone's interested in watching that back um if i just move on to the next question so this might be a question for emma and um, in terms of questions presented at the at the interview stage how much is focused on the environment and how much on fisheries do you want to come on to that it's more about your experience so it'll be biased towards what area of work you work in so if you are purely fisheries it'll focus mostly around that and sustainability um, or if it's general environment, it'll be about that. But it's just picking up that you can demonstrate those competencies in your everyday work. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. Um, there's a question here again about CPD. Um, they've mentioned that they've been documenting their CPD for a while now. Um, and basically, so to sort of get ready for when they apply, is this useful? And I would, I would just, if I come on to that first, I guess I, I think that would that's a great idea uh, to sort of get used to recording your CPD um, for now, even if you're not um, planning to apply quite yet. It's just useful to sort of get into the habit of that um, and to show how you're building skills to yourself as well, I think. Um, and if I just come on to another question that was uh, submitted. Just, in a, sorry, go on. Just, sorry. just on that one, I, I did um, keep my CPD for the 12 months before I went back and, and totaled it all up and I submitted that as an appendix with my application for, for just that reason, just to show that it's not something you've just started because of this. It's something that you are doing as, as part of your sort of day job. Yes. Yeah, it's good to include in your interview as well. So demonstrating how you're going to continue to develop as well once you have your chartered status. Yeah, I think that's a good point, isn't it? Because we always say that chartership's not just about demonstrating your expertise, but building it further through CPD as well. So it's, you know, it's an ongoing process. Nobody sort of has all the answers straight away and, and it's kind of ongoing. Um, brilliant. Um, so another question here that was submitted in advance. Um, um, maybe this question more for Emma, but Pete, feel free to come in as well. Um, so what job roles do CMs in the fisheries sector typically do? So I suppose, what kind of roles do you see that people are doing that are applying, like, you know, through what you you, you do? What, what kind of job roles do you see come up a lot? Most recently, we've had a lot of consultancies. So people working as fisheries biologists or ecologists in consultancies. Um, in NRW, it's... In the past, it's been a lot of senior fisheries monitoring officers um, or roles like myself. So advisors for the for say, so I cover fisheries monitoring and ecology monitoring or environmental impact specialists. Um, I've always had Pete, who's a fisheries officer. Um, Pete, have you come across many of the people who've been applying? No, but then I, d I don't always see them because they, they come through you guys. So, um, no, sorry, can't help you on that one. We do, we've got a couple of people coming through from Rivers Trusts as well. And we have a, we have a massive um, diversity in that we'll have people with doctorates who are producing lots of academic papers a year. Um, people with just a master's who've basically got their four or five years experience. I want to progress further and again people without formal qualification so it is a massive variety of applicants from people who've only just got the amount of experience needed to do the application to people who've been in it for 20 25 years well, that's yeah it's good to good to note that that there's such diversity in the um the kind of roles and and kind of um experience as well so no thank you for that don't I don't see any more questions so I think I will just end the webinar uh, here so can I just say a huge thank you to Pete and Emma for all their great insights today and to Ian as well from the IFM for his help uh, with developing the webinar behind the scenes and um, as I mentioned earlier we 
on top of today's webinar, we have a number of dedicated guidance videos designed to help anyone interested in becoming a CM. So please go and check out our YouTube channel, which again is uh, youtube.com YouTube forward slash society for the environment. Um, and, and that's it from us today. So um, thank you for watching and taking part. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at one of our future webinars. Thank you.